Jordy will give the final presentation of the day. And I just want to, um, because right after this, we'll head over to the, to the ROM, the Royal Ontario Museum. It's a five minute walk from here for the reception. Um, but Jordy, the, you know, the reason that I asked uh, if you would you know, give the closing presentation today is that, uh, first of all, you saw Michael in the first incarnation uh, and I remember him walking in uh, to the lab uh, when it was the 30 people in the room down the hall and he, he uh, brought the first version of the lamp. Oh yeah, I remember. <laughs> and, um, and that was, he was demonstrating his material on the lamp and you, the remark you said to him was never go anywhere without that lamp. Uh, so people need to be able to see it as opposed to you just explaining it. Uh, but also because the, you know, I'm not sure that everyone fully recognized the breakthrough that, that um, Michael just described. In other words, this is not just a, uh, you know, month on month uh, growth in users. This was a sort of foundational scientific breakthrough that he just described. Mm -hmm. um, and he did it on a machine that uh, you created. And, uh, and so, you know, when you, joined the lab as one of the founding uh, fellows that uh, that was very meaningful to us because you've, uh, you've developed a, uh, a business, uh, founded a company uh, that was such a scientific leap of faith at the time you started it um, <clears throat> that it was important to us that we had that type of uh, viewpoint and mindset uh, in the, on the, the uh, G7. And then personally, uh, the fact that you're closing this is very meaningful to me because you and I are both offspring uh, of Hague. In other words, people yeah. keep talking about the 30 people down the hall. Uh, but I think you and I know that it's actually 30 people at the tip of Point Grey yep. uh, in Hague Ferris's class uh, where I was an engineering student, you were a physicist student. Mm -hmm. uh, and we both learned what we know uh, from your class, Hague. Uh, so a lot of this is really the result of your work uh, for the last you know, 40 years on the West Coast. Yeah. It's all yours. Thanks, Ajay. I'm uh, cognizant that I'm standing between you and the end of the day. Um, so I'm going to try to make this uh, pretty exciting, and I think it will be, um, largely because of Michael's work. So uh, when... We started talking about doing a quantum machine learning track at the CDL. I kind of concur, I, I thought it was the greatest and the worst idea I'd ever heard kind of at the same time. Uh, it was a great idea because, so I, everything I've been involved in has been a little bit, uh, let's say forward looking, uh, a little bit too early, but it's all worked. And I think the reason is that you, you have, to, you have to be too early, especially in long cycle technological projects, to have any chance at all. You, you can't come into a field when it's already um, uh, being invested in significantly by Google or Facebook or IBM and compete. You just can't, not in something fundamental. You have to come in really early before it's ready. And so when the, the quantum machine learning track was proposed, the way I thought of it, which I think is healthy, is that it, it was five, seven years too early, but that was okay because there are ways for all of these companies to make their way through the world as the underlying ecosystem in quantum computing caught up. Uh, so what I thought I'd do uh, is to try to give you a, a little bit of a flavor about at least how I think of quantum computing because I understand this is a very kind of exotic thing and uh, most of you in the room will have, be, have been uh, befuddled by some of the things that you've seen. Some of it might not make any sense. There's no context for any of this. Why are people so interested in this sort of stuff when there doesn't appear to be anything tangible yet? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a flavor for why this is. And uh, to start that process, I want to tell you something shocking about the world. Uh, maybe you appreciate this already, maybe you don't. The things that you see around you, the instincts you have for the physical world, 
um, are in some profound sense wrong. So everything that you know about common sense, the rules of logic, uh, the way the world is, is, uh, is not strictly speaking correct. And the reason for this is that the, uh, the, the things that we observe at the large scale, the sort of things that we touch with our fingers, uh, inherit their properties from a set of laws that are much more profound and underlie all matter and energy, the laws of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics you can think of as a playbook or a framework or a set of rules that is the best guess that modern science has to explain what is, you know, the ontological nature of the universe, what is actually out there. And these laws are um, very different than the sorts of things that we've come to know and expect. In fact, uh, they, they contain at their hearts things that contradict our common sense view of the world. Things like the, uh, the, the concurrent existence of, of two uh, logically, uh, um, uh, impo so if you have two things that can't be true together, our common sense says it's either one or the other. But in the quantum realm, that's no longer true. You can have situations where things can be in two different states that are not compatible at the same time. And there is a lot of uh, flowery language and um, ideas that have de been developed to help our uh, limited human minds understand things like this. And one of them that I like as a, as a way to think about the way to kind of conceptualize all of this is to imagine that the reality that we uh, observe is but one of many uncountably large numbers of realities. And every time an event happens, which you can try to define what that means, the, this thing kind of splits. So at a very crude level, you can imagine when you make a decision to leave this room, which door you exit is potentially not predetermined. You can still choose. And in some of these branches of the multiverse, you'll choose to go through one door, and another one you'll choose to go through another door. So these are very strange uh, concepts. Um, now one of the uh, leading thinkers in the modern era of quantum mechanics is a guy named Richard Feynman, who I'm sure that most of you have heard of. And he was uh, arguably the person who first came up with the idea of a quantum computer. And uh, back as far as the late 50s, he was thinking about what happens when you make things really small, like really small. And the things that he was thinking about might have been gears or things like this. But when you make things very, very, very small, they start to lose the common sense nature of our world. And they inherit these more fundamental properties, this rich set of very strange rules that exist down at the very cold and the very small. And an obvious question is, if you can build things that are small, a computer is a thing. Why can't you build a computer that's really small? And if you could, how would it work? Because when you build a machine that's very small, it doesn't behave at all like a big machine. When you make a gear the size of an atom, it doesn't behave like a it behaves like something very different. So what happens when you make a computer behave according to an entirely new set of physical laws? And the answer is simple. What's, what you can compute is ultimately set only by the laws of physics. The reason why our computers are limited today has nothing to do really with Moore's law or the, the skills of software engineers or algorithm developers. The fundamental speed limit to computers are the laws of physics. You cannot break them. That's the kind of definitionally what a law of physics is. But there's a loophole. Because the laws that govern our machines that are built out of silicon are not the only game in town. There's this other thing going on underneath them. So what if, what if you could build a computer that used quantum physics, that could have access to these unimaginably large pathways through time? If you could take a computer and allow it to tap into this language of the nature at its most fundamental, what would happen? 
And that was the question he asked in this essay, the simulating physics with computers. It's marvelous, by the way. There's a lot of technical stuff in it, but it contains the kinds of insights that I think uh, editorial uh, is lacking from theoretical physics nowadays. Like the, this guy was a true visionary and genius and it's worth reading if you're interested in the history of computation. So uh, what he said about these machines is this is really complicated. I don't know, but there's one thing I know for sure that the quantum world like materials and in fact any, anything in our world that inherits its properties from the microscopic so think about anything whose properties come from electrons. That's a lot of stuff. Or photons. That's also a lot of stuff. All of those things, materials, drugs, enzymes, catalysts, all that stuff that comes from the quantum world. If you could build a quantum computer, you would have a, a laboratory for, for doing experiments without having to build the thing, which is exactly what Michael was talking about. So the whole revolution that started the quantum information theory computing stuff was hinged on one of the most brilliant physicists of the time saying, maybe you could do what Michael just said. And that was in 1982. So since that time, a lot has happened. Not enough, but a lot. And we moved from the uh, theoretical physics world to quantum computing being such an sort of a, um, uh, important sounding thing for the future that even the CEOs of major tech corporations are including quantum computing in the discussion of uh, what the future of technology may look like. And again, like Feynman, uh, the CEO of Microsoft is talking about the exact same type of problem. So if you read the transcript of his presentation, which I did, most of the things, in fact, like nearly all of them that he talks about with quantum computing have to do with the exact same problem that Michael is talking about with maybe a different skin on it. So finding catalysts for carbon from the atmosphere is the exact same problem Michael was talking about. So are the other things that he's talking about. And, and these are such a microscopic segment of what it would really mean to be able to model the physical world properly at that level. It, virtually all of the things that um, come from the pharmaceutical industry are, are, are sub-microscopic in their nature. So a drug, it's a little molecule. It might come in a pill or a shot, but the thing that does the thing is a tiny little molecule. It's a quantum thing. It's not a classical thing. It's not like you're eating a little widget. You're eating a thing which is inherently not, it's alien to our way of thinking. And the reasons why we don't have better health care are not simple, but one of them is it's really, really hard for people who study these things to build better drugs because they can't simulate them, which means they have to build them in the lab, which means they have to take a long time and do a lot of stuff before you get to where you're going. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap by trying to give you a little bit of insight into how I see how to think about quantum computing. Uh, I'm no longer in this field. I've moved on to something else. But um, I was in it long enough to understand some things about how it works. So I don't have a dog in the fight anymore. Um, but I do, I think, I've gained a little bit of distance and I can, I can look at this, um, I think, in a way that will help the people in the room if you're interested in the field. So there are basically two games in town when it comes to hardware. There's uh, what's called the gate model, which is, I'd say, the, uh, the dominant uh, paradigm for understanding the, uh, the use cases and specifically things for quantum simulation. So the original vision of Feynman and, and it's being carried forward. The gate model thing is killer app is in this simulation of the, the, uh, the physical world. Now, there's a lot of things about what you hear in the, in the press that I think are misleading. So I'm gonna give you my view. It's very easy to build something that's at 100 qubit scale. So when you hear announcements about 70 qubits and all that, that's greenfield easy. Uh, the, the reasons have, are complicated, but building something to that scale in a semiconductor process is tr almost trivial. So it's not a big accomplishment. The hard part is making it bigger. And that scaling is underneath the difficulty of, of the Moore's Law progression. 
is that there are real good reasons why you can't just make something big. Some th semiconductor devices, and this is one of, it's not a semiconductor device, but same kind of process. There are reasons why you can't just go from a hundred to a million are not because you're not investing enough money and they're not because you're not smart. They have to do with very fundamental processes that, that, that drive the progression. And so when you want to look at uh, when to invest, depending on your risk profile, this first category, which is uh, Rigetti, IBM, Google, um, uh, there's Xanadu also, although they're a little bit of a different case because they're doing something uh, a little bit different and I think more interesting. But um, all of those guys, getting to the point where you can, reper you can have a business which is based on this hardware, which is robust and easy to use and all that, I think is at least seven years away. So between now and then, you can do a lot of cool stuff. I'm not saying that you won't. But if you're thinking about like, how long it's going to take for this stuff to stabilize, I think it's seven years, give or take. And every one of these is going to, it's going to cost about $500 million to get to that point. And a lot of that cost has to do with infrastructure building, like fab. Uh, D-Wave is a separate case, because D-Wave has been doing this a lot longer than everyone else. And it's using a different um, computational paradigm, which is designed to do something different. Now, got lucky that Michael and his group were so smart to be able to use the D-Wave stuff for simulation, but it's not really what it was designed to do. What it was designed to do is um, a certain kind of machine learning, which is called learning over discrete variables, things like probabilistic graphical models and Bayesian networks. So it was designed to do something else. But I think that the, a key point is that I, the number of physical qubits you need, like the devices, the integration level, is going to be the same for both of these models to get to what I'm calling profit, which is to be able to have a business that's consistently profitable past that barrier of always having to raise money. In terms of the, my, the strategic advice I'd have for people who are thinking about investing in this field, for me, it's absolutely drop dead simple. The, there has to be consolidation and competition in this but only after the big players get serious. The last one I would mention, though, is applications. So of all of this decades of thinking and all these academic work on quantum computing, Michael's result is the first one I've ever seen that I would call commercially meaningful, ever. You know, and it's just happening now. And it's kind of like the, the, uh, the realization of billions of dollars of investment in some ways. You know, like the entire industry has striven to get to this point. And what's remarkable is it's coming out of our lab. Like this is a globally important thing. I think maybe Michael was downplaying it a little bit, but this is basically the reason why quantum computation is a thing was to try to do that. And it's close. It's not there yet, but it's close. So if I was uh, going to give you some advice on uh, how to participate in this as investors, the number one thing I would advise you is to look at the supply chain of the future of this field and try to figure out which of those guys are going to get knocked out when the Googles and the Microsofts start fighting over the supply chain. Because there's going to be bidding wars for these guys and there aren't very many of them and one of them is OTI. So I think that it, as a, as a, as a as an investment strategy, if you're interested in quantum computation, I would myself stay away from hardware. You don't want the processor guys. What you want is their infrastructure because the money, the real money is going to come from outside. It's going to come from Google ad revenue. It's not going to come from inside. Uh, and that's where you want to um, uh, stake your claims. Okay, thanks very much and uh, thanks for having me out here.